everybody. In this video, I'm going to give you a basic overview of the three main quantum mechanical systems that we are studying in this course. As I discussed in the previous DL, quantum mechanics is super weird and non-intuitive, and the math gets very dense very fast. So we're not going to go over the details of why these quantum mechanical systems behave this way. Instead, I'm just going to show you the results and discuss qualitatively what they mean. We'll start with a particle in a box. I did actually show you most of the details of how to derive the behavior of this particle in the last DL's overview. We'll just summarize the results here, and you can go back and check that video for the details. A particle in a box behaves like a standing wave on a string with both ends fixed. The wavelengths of the particle are therefore constrained to be one of these, where remember that n is an integer. The fact that the particles are only allowed to have very specific wavelengths means that they're also only allowed to have very specific momentum, given by this equation. Using this, we can determine the allowed energies of the particle. We can do this because there's a direct relationship between kinetic energy and momentum. That relationship is this. Kinetic energy is just equal to the momentum squared divided by 2m. Plugging this in to this equation, we get that the kinetic energy has to be the following. As with the momentum and the wavelength, the kinetic energy is only allowed to take on specific values. n always has to be an integer, and so the particle is not allowed to have just any kinetic energy that it wants. Next, we're interested in the behavior of an electron in a hydrogen atom. We use a hydrogen atom in quantum mechanics as a model system because it's quite simple. The simplest hydrogen atom only involves one proton and one electron, so it's actually possible to solve the equations of quantum mechanics by hand. That being said, the mathematics of that is still way too involved for this course, so let's just talk about the behavior. The electron in a hydrogen atom basically behaves like a three-dimensional particle in a box, with some differences. The electron is not allowed to go to the center of the atom. So, just like the particle in a box, there's a node at the location of the proton. The proton effectively behaves like a three-dimensional standing wave. It's impossible to do a demonstration of what this looks like. There are some pictures in your DL manual that hopefully should help you out. Just as with the particle in a box, the particle in the hydrogen atom can only have very specific energies. It's not allowed to have just any energy that it wants. The energies that the electron is allowed to have is given by this equation. There are two parameters in this equation, z and n. z represents the number of protons in the atom. It's only possible to get an equation that can be written down like this when there's a single electron in the atom. Of course, large atoms have much more than one electron but we can still always imagine a scenario where we have a single electron and many protons. n is the other parameter. It's just like the n in the particle in a box. It has to be an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. However, notice that in this case, the n is in the denominator of the fraction. Think of it like this. When the electron and proton are close together, the potential energy is very negative. As the electron goes up in its energy level, it's actually approaching zero potential energy. If it actually gets to zero potential energy, that's what we call ionization, where the electron is actually removed from the atom entirely. If you draw out the energy levels, they look like this. The higher that n gets, the closer the energy levels actually become. So how does an electron transfer from one energy level to the other? Let's think about an electron sitting at the first energy level. It has to receive a kick to be bumped up to the second energy level. But it can't just be any kick. 
the electron is not allowed to exist between energy levels. It has to be here or here or here. So the amount of energy that must be in the kick has to be equal to the amount of energy between the energy level that the electron is currently sitting at and the energy level that the electron wants to go to. For example, let's imagine that we have an electron sitting at n equals 1, and we want to kick it up to n equals 2. Let's calculate how much energy we need to get from here to here. That amount is just the difference in these energies. For simplicity, let's just assume that this is a hydrogen atom, and so there's a single proton. The energy level of the proton at n equals 1 is just this. And the energy level at n equals 2 is just this. So the difference in energy between this energy level and this energy level is 10.2 electron volts. In other words, the electron has to gain exactly 10.2 electron volts of energy in order to jump from the first orbital to the second orbital. It's worth taking a moment to talk about what electron volts actually are. In this class, we've been using joules as the unit of energy. However, on the scale of an atom, a joule is a massive amount of energy. It's sort of like measuring the amount of water in a raindrop in units of liters. A liter is a lot of water, and a raindrop has very, very little water. So it's not very useful to use these units. An electron volt is called an electron volt because it's the amount of kinetic energy that an electron would have if it was placed in a location with one volt and allowed to travel to a location with zero volts. Lastly, we're going to look at one more quantum mechanical system. This one is known as the quantum harmonic oscillator. Before we think about the quantum harmonic oscillator, let's think about a non-quantum harmonic oscillator. We've actually seen examples of this before. The easiest example to think of is a weight on a spring. If we pull the mass down and release it, the system will bounce up and down. If it was a perfect spring, this would go on forever. Of course, this doesn't actually happen because there's energy lost in the spring itself. It turns out that we can think about bonds between atoms as harmonic oscillators. A harmonic oscillator has energy that is given by this equation. As with the particle in the box and the hydrogen atom, there are only specific values of energy that are allowed because n is only allowed to be an integer. However, in the hydrogen atom and in the particle in a box, the amount of space between the energy levels changed as the energy increased. This is not the case with the harmonic oscillator. The energy levels are always the same distance apart. If we were to draw it out, as we did with the hydrogen atom, it would look like this. E naught just represents the lowest possible energy of the system. It turns out in quantum mechanics, it's not possible for this energy to be zero. It has to have some minimum energy, which we call E naught. If we plug zero into this equation for n, we just get out E naught as the energy. n equals one gives us three E naught. n equals two gives us five E naught. n equals three gives us seven E naught, and so on. Just like with the hydrogen atom, the quantum harmonic oscillator can only change its energy level by receiving a kick with the exact amount of energy between the level it's presently at and the level that it's going to. In both this case and in the hydrogen atom, this generally happens by the absorption of a photon. A photon is just a little packet of light that has a very specific amount of energy. The energy is very simple. It's given by this equation. Here, H is just Planck's constant, and F is the frequency of the photon. Remember that light behaves like both a particle and a wave sometimes. F is the frequency of the light wave that the photon is a part of. Let's do a very quick example. 
we know that the energy of the lowest energy level in the harmonic oscillator is E0. And we know that the energy level of the first excited state of the harmonic oscillator is 3 E0. So the difference between those energy levels is just 2 E0. If a photon came in and hit the harmonic oscillator with exactly that amount of energy, the harmonic oscillator would be bumped up to this energy level. We could figure out then the frequency of the light wave that would be necessary to make this transition. Let's just plug in 2 E0 for the energy and solve for the frequency. You could do this exact same process with the hydrogen atom. You would just need to figure out how much energy is needed to transition from one energy level to the other energy level, and then set it equal to HF. In all these cases, it's also possible for the energy of the system to decrease. The change in energy between two energy levels doesn't depend on whether or not that energy is increasing or decreasing. However, as you might expect, the process is slightly different. In order for the energy level to increase, the system must absorb a photon of the correct frequency. Whereas if the energy level is decreasing, the system will be emitting a photon of that frequency. Again, the energies of the photons and therefore the frequencies will be the same. It's just that in one case, the system is taking energy in, and in the other case, the system is letting energy out. If you've taken chemistry, you've probably seen some of these things already. There's a number of wonderful applications of these phenomena. For example, suppose you have a light source as well as a piece of equipment that can tell you how bright the light is at a bunch of different frequencies. Then suppose that you put a cloud of gas in between the light and your detector. Because the atoms of the cloud of gas behave quantum mechanically, the gas will only absorb very specific frequencies of light. If you then measure that light with your instrument, you'll see dips in the strength of the light at those frequencies. Every element has a specific set of frequencies that it likes to absorb. It's like a fingerprint of the element. Knowing this is an incredibly powerful tool and it allows us to do all sorts of amazing things in fields like astronomy and chemistry.